Okay, uh, I actually wanted to say something before I started because um, a few speeches yesterday just made me think of things, um, especially uh, one of them was Shabnam June's speech about fear, and the other was Arash John's speech about, um, you know, bad things don't happen to good people. So my story, just really quick, I wanted to share it, is, I mean, I've said it before in studies um, back in San Jose, but um, I just remember one time I was, I was younger, um, and I was uh, sitting with uh, somebody that I knew, they weren't a submitter, and uh, they had diabetes, and they were injecting themselves with insulin in front of me. And I was a kid, I didn't know what was going on, and I remember just looking, and then they turned and they looked at me, and they were like, this is gonna happen to you someday. And I was just looking at them, and I was like thinking to myself, no way. <laughs> if I submit and I do God's commands, there's no way that that would happen to a submitter, inshallah. So that's why whenever people say stuff about perfect happiness and, you know, perfect life, perfect health, I believe it. And it makes me feel good, mashallah. It makes me, like, strengthened, and I know it's God's promise, and it doesn't, you know, it's not a bad thing. This is a gift from God. This is something that is, you know, reassuring. Praise God. So, um, okay, I'm going to start with my robots. Okay, so I'll give you a little quick background about this before I actually go with my, um, my speech. Okay, so uh, yesterday I was looking through the speeches and the day before that, and I noticed, like, everybody's speeches were very lengthy and good, and mine was going to be super lengthy. So I cut a lot. Like, I was going to do an experiment. I was going to do this. I was going to do that. And I was, like, thinking to myself, you know, um, I need to edit. So there's, it's going to be jumping around some places, but it's going to come together, inshallah. I'm praying to God. So um, a bits of, okay, so my, as you can see, I'm talking about robots. Um, a bit of it does go with Serena's speech. So I'm going to, God willing, try not to repeat what she said, but it's going to come with my spin on it, inshallah. So, robots. Okay, so I'm going to start off with what is a robot, right? So it's a machine capable of carrying out a complex series of actions automatically, especially one programmable by a computer. So the worldly definition of robots is that they serve people without question because they can't question. So what's, okay, so that's gonna lead into the next slide. So, okay, what kind of robots are we familiar with? Like, okay, media, right? So we have the good robots, right? We have C-3PO and R2-D2, and I don't know the name of the little one, but I guess like the new generation. Yeah, BB-2, barbecue, BB-8, oh, sorry. I'm not, I'm an old school Star Wars person, I guess. I don't know. So, um, yeah, okay. So these are the good robots, right? These are the ones that were programmed. They have like their, you know, but they are, they're still programmed to serve, um, you know, the, the person that programmed them and everything, right? They have, and then we have, of course, this robot. We have Terminator, Skynet, okay. So this is the robot that's like the evil robot, right? This is the one that, um, yeah, okay. You guys have not seen Terminator? Okay, never mind. <laughs> All right, so what are the differences, okay, what differences are there between robots and a human? So on this planet, we have robots. We know that they are and what they do. So they serve us unquestioningly. But is that the only reason why robots exist? So, the fact that we have robots on this planet, it allows us to see how important and unique it is that we can think and do things. Like, sure, we have robots that do things for us. Like, that might not look like, you know, the Star Wars one with the walking around and shooting lasers or whatever. But they, we have, like, robots that translate. We have robots that... Uh, Actually, was so Sarah John, your thing about the library made me actually think about this. Like the university I went to, they actually have robots in there that actually put the books now. <laughs> so they have robots that you know put books for you. They have robots that do like everything, right? So, but you know, what's the difference between that kind of robot and what we do? So we have this. I put this little comic of this like lady with the robot, and she's basically you know programming it to feel, to think. Well, kind of trying to. 
Oh, okay. So um, before I press play on the or play on this video, so there's obviously a mechanical aspect of robots. We're made of different materials. So robots are made out of machines. We're made out of water and cells, right? But let's start off with something that even the most complex supercomputer AI can't emulate, which is the brain, the human brain. So I'm going to have you guys watch this little video really quick, inshallah. Hopefully. The emergence of superpowered artificial intelligence that will far exceed the processing capacity of human beings and completely change the way we exist, as the likes of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk both prepare us and warn us about the coming singularity, let us take a look at what remains the most powerful supercomputer on the planet, the human brain. Weighing a mere three pounds, the human brain is made up of an estimated 100 billion cells called neurons, with each of these neurons having up to 1000 synapses or connections to other neurons. Let's compare the power of the human brain against other computer processors we have today. One of the fastest consumer computers you can currently buy housing an Intel i9 chip has a processing power of one teraflop, or one trillion computations every second. This is thousands of times faster than computers from just a few decades ago. But what about supercomputers? As of the end of 2017, the fastest supercomputer, the Sunway Tau Light, has a processing power of 93 petaflops, or 93 quadrillion computations every second, which is 93 followed by 15 zeros. This is three times as fast as the previous supercomputer it overtook. The human brain, however, is still far more powerful, with an estimated processing power of one exaflop, or one, followed by 18 zeros. What's even more remarkable is the efficiency of this astronomical power. While an Intel i9 chip uses 140 watts of energy, and the Sunway supercomputer uses 15 megawatts, the human brain operates on a mere 20 watts of energy. Now that is efficiency. This efficiency is achieved by the way neurons interact. A conventional computer works in binary bits, with each bit coding for a zero or a one. A quantum supercomputer works with qubits, which can be zero, one, or both, providing even more processing ability. And the human brain is even more complex, with each neuron encoding several possibilities in response to a stimulus. For example, a neuron can fire, not fire, inhibit, fire in synchrony, or fire in a dynamic pattern, providing a wide variety of possible permutations. How much memory capacity does this give us? Researchers at the Salk Institute have estimated that each synapse in the brain holds 4.7 bits of memory, giving us an estimate of 1 petabyte or 1 million gigabytes. That's more than 30,000 iPhone X's or 10 or however you want to call it. That means you could store 4.7 billion books or 3 million hours of TV recordings on your brain. To power a similar sized computer, you need a gigawatt of energy or a nuclear power plant to supply it, yet the brain functions on 20 watts of energy thanks to efficiency of biological systems using cellular energy like ATP. In fact, this memory works much like a traditional search engine does. For example, now that you've watched this video and subscribed to Dr. Stick Figure, a certain neuron or cluster of entangled neurons will activate every time you see Dr. Stick Figure, what we will call the Dr. Stick Figure neuron. The same works for your grandma, your favorite athlete, or your crush although other things might also activate okay. in your body okay. then. It is useful to compare the brain's functions to systems we already Lord understand. Apple. For example, at night while you sleep, your brain acts like YouTube, replaying your day to store or remove certain memories. This allows the brain to transfer memories from being stored in the hippocampus as short-term memory to the gray matter of the outer neocortex as long-term memory. Some research has shown that studying before sleep leads to better long-term retention of information. Not only is the brain like a search engine and a video streaming service, but also acts as a GPS. The 2014 Nobel Prize for Medicine was awarded to a group of researchers for finding that different sets of neurons activated when rats were in different places, serving as a map within the brain. They call these place cells that exist in the hippocampus, which explains why patients with Alzheimer's have difficulty recognizing their surroundings. Even more intriguing is the brain's unique ability to transform photons, sound waves, and chemical information into electrical signals and neurons and encode these signals into meaningful information for the user. And the most fascinating part of the human brain is that we are just scratching the surface. Neuroscience is a thriving field and we are just beginning to understand the sophisticated supercomputer of the brain. And ironically, it is likely we will need superpowered artificial intelligence to fully understand our own brains. Okay, we can stop there. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with it. Okay, so basically, I'm gonna just quick on this. So the human brain can do a bunch of things extra. Like we have the ability to process sound and 
GPS and everything. And you know, the, the most powerful computer cannot even come close. Like we need a nuclear power plant to power, right? We just need like, what is it, 21 watt? I don't know, it's like a few watts, right? That's how efficient our bodies are. And so I could go into a whole new you know, talk about just how amazing our bodies are and how our brains are. But I'm gonna go back onto even more things. Okay, let's go a bit further than that. So, sorry, my notes turned off. Okay, so we have free will and consciousness. We can question and think for ourselves. So what about robots and submission? So we have free will. We serve each other. So I'm going to, I know Serena read this, but I just want to emphasize that God does not want robots. So the dispute in the heavenly community, as stated in 3869, describes and proves that God's creatures possess the freedom of choice. They have minds of their own. The rebellion of a minuscule minority among God's creatures has served to emphasize the wonderful fact that God's creatures serve him because they appreciate his infinite magnificence. Without the rebellion, we would have never known that freedom is God's gift to his creatures. So God doesn't need us. We actually serve each other, right? We're here, like, you know, if we, like, go out there and, you know, we're doing work, somebody's maybe cleaning your house, somebody's doing this, somebody's doing that. So we're, you know, serving each other, and we serve God because we appreciate being in God's kingdom. We want to be rejoined back to to his, you know, we want, we need him. He does not need us, basically. So there's a dude serving. <laughs> okay, so the purpose of our existence. So 51, 56. I did not create the jinns and the humans except to worship me alone. I need no provision from them, nor do I need them to feed me. God is the provider, the possessor of all power, the supreme. So freedom of choice. This, uh, whenever I read this, I think of like how dumb I was. Anyway, okay, so the, the freedom of choice. So 3372, we have offered the responsibility, freedom of choice to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, but they refused to bear it and were afraid of it. But the human being accepted it. He was transgressing ignorant. So the animals, trees, stars, etc., took advantage of this, right? They took advantage of the offer. So I kind of was going through the different ways of how basically we kind of messed up, like many times, right? We got here. We, you know, the, the original sin. I'm not going to go into that because obviously that's going to be another long speech. But we basically, you know, we have the freedom to choose. And we have been, and, you know, we had many choice, chances to go back to God, but we made our mistakes, and uh, I was going to go, I'm going to go over a few of them, actually, that I thought was very interesting of how we messed up. So, how are we ignorant? This is our final chance. So, one of the ways we were ignorant was we did not make a firm stand. Okay, so this is the Osh experiment. Okay, I'm going to play this video really quick, inshallah. The Osh experiment is one of psychology's oldest most popular pieces of research. A volunteer is told that he's taking part in a visual perception test. What he doesn't know is that the other participants are actors and he's the only person taking part in the real test, which is actually about group conformity. Please begin. The experiment you will be taking part in today involves the perception of line length. Your task will be simply to look at the line here on the left and indicate which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. So, for example, if you think the actors have been told to match the wrong lines. The volunteer will be monitored to see if he gives the correct answer or if he goes along with the opinion of the group and gives the wrong answer. In the first test, the correct answer is two. Uh, one. 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 Two. One. Once again, the correct answer is two. Three. 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 The Ash experiment has been repeated 
many times and the results have been uh, supported again and again. We will conform to the group. Again, we're very social creatures. We're very much aware of what the people around us think. Uh, we want to be liked. We don't want to be seen to rock the boat. So we will go along with the group, even if we don't believe what people are saying. Okay, so you can watch the rest of the video if you want. I can give you the link. But basically, okay, so we were swept in the crowd. We went there. We, the guy knew in his heart that it was two. He knew it was the right answer, but because everybody else was saying it was one, he was like, oh, maybe, you know, he's right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm seeing something weird. And that's what happened to us in the heavenly society. We knew inside, God willing, that it was, you know, that there is one God, but we did not make a firm stand. So how can we stop from being swept in the crowd again? So God gives us the worship practices, salat, zakat, fasting, hajj, remembering God throughout our day. We can say God's name before we eat. We say God willing, inshallah, and God's gift, mashallah, whenever, you know, inshallah when we're going to do something, and mashallah when we, you know, see something or receive something, we want God's protection on it. It's God's gift to us. Oops. So... Something that I want to mention is, you know, these worship practices, Satan has made it to be like a chore for traditional Muslims and many people, right? Like, oh man, like, I gotta do my, pr like, uh, I, I used to practice um, as a traditional before the message, and I would do my salats, like, uh, what is it, uh, you, you do the, the zor and ass together, so your salat was ridiculously long. And uh, for me, I remember when I was younger, I was like, wow, I did not want to do this really long, long prayer. And it was just, you know, it was, it was made so hard. It was, it was put in a way to, to make it seem like, you know, oh, you know, I got to do it. But now that we know the truth, and of course it's purified now, I know that I don't even have to do it that way. God has the religion so easy for us. It's a gift. The fact that I can remember God, and I'm doing this to get my soul bigger so I can go back to God, God willing, this is like, God doesn't need me. God doesn't need any of us. We need God. So these gifts that we have, I want to do my salat. I definitely want to give my zakat. I want to fast. I want to go on my hajj. I want to do all these things because I want to go back to God's kingdom, God willing. So now, what do we do with our freedom of choice? So we have a choice here. We have the choice to side with God or side with Satan. So there's two points of view on this earth. Well, in this test, right? Okay. So I wanted to actually give a quick story. Call it, it's a story about the... Um, okay, I always give stories. But this is a story about uh, the training of, of baby elephants at a circus. I thought this was very interesting. So I wanted to read this really quick. So the way that they train baby elephants for the circus has a good lesson on how we should be appreciative of our free will. So circus trainers take the baby elephants when they are still small and tie a strong rope around their necks and attach the rope to a secure pole. The baby elephant mature, naturally tries to walk away and they're stopped by the rope. They pull and push and twist and turn and eventually figure out that they are just aren't strong enough to break free of their shackles. So they stop resisting and just stay where they are. The next time they tie up the baby elephants, they try to break away once again, pulling on the rope to see if they can go free. When they figure out that once again it is futile, they stop pulling and settle down where they are. The same thing happens over and over until eventually, when the rope is put over their heads, they no longer pull and push and try to break free because they think it's futile. This is why in captivity, you can walk by a circus and see giant elephants, like giant elephants, there's like tons, right? So they're standing there passively with a rope tied around their neck that isn't tied to anything at all. The elephant becomes so accustomed to being held back by the rope that merely the rope itself keeps the animal in check. If they only realized by the time they have grown up, even a rope secured to a pole can no longer contain them. It was an illusion. They would know that the tr what the true freedom is. 
but they don't. So we're here in Satan's kingdom and we see all these things around us and people, majority of them, they think that this is what it is. This is how it's supposed to be. They think that, you know, you can walk around, um, accidents happen, misery happens, and this is it. Like we, I listened to all the, much of the speeches before, you know, like, uh, much less Sarah John gave that speech about um, Stephen Hawking, you know, there's no, there's nothing after this. This is, this is it. You know, this is how it's supposed to be. And actually, if you try to explain to some people, they'll get angry at you because they think that, you know, what do you mean? Like, uh, there, there's something, you know, beyond this life. So now, this story makes me think of how we are here in this world to exercise our freedom and break of our, free of our shackles with our ancient alliance with Satan. So now, as per the movie Matrix, there is a famous pill scene, right? Now it is your turn. When you, we made, uh, then we made you inheritors of the earth after them to see how you will do. We can either choose to stay tied to Satan's point of view, or we can break free and go back to God's kingdom, inshallah. Let us use our free will. We're not robots. Let us all, God willing, submit willingly and be appreciative of the gift that, of freedom that God has given us. Red pill and the blue pill. That's it. Thank you. All right. Any questions? Good. No questions. No questions? Oh. So okay. since uh, we are not robots, um, what kind of um, uh, benefit as humans be human beings that that uh, we we do our we do our worship because we want to we want to appreciate God's omnipotence. Yeah. So how uh, how would you um, deal with uh, people who want to stay robots? Like uh, they just want to go and and be absorbed by this illusion. Uh, like we, you know, we're dealing with friends, you know, coworkers and things like that. How would you get them to snap out of this? Or, or would you be, you know, saying something, uh, like give them a story like this, or give them, uh, uh, like maybe point out to the Matrix movie, uh, that sort of thing? Well, how would you do it? I'm just how would I, okay. Well, I mean, uh, so, okay, I think I understand correctly with, how would I tell them that they're in an illusion? Uh, so, I, it, I mean, it depends on the person, how I'm talking to, like, definitely we want to use, you know, I'm not going to steal your t wisdom and kind enlightenment, but um, I, I definitely think that we need to, yeah, I know, I'm just, mashallah, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that like if we are trying to wake somebody up because we love them, we care about them, we will give them the truth, but that's all that we can do. We can remind and we can tell them. Like in the movie, the guy gives the choice. Like there's the, he, he has a, so I don't know if you guys have seen The Matrix, but basically the guy comes up to the main character and he says, I give you a choice. You know, you can take the blue pill and you go back to what you were doing. You, you stay as a robot, you stay as whatever you were in this life. Or I give you the red pill and you see what's really going on. So you give that, op, that choice to people and Sometimes it freaks people out. Like I've tried to talk to people and I remember uh, one of them was like, I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready, I'll just, I'll wait. I, I need to wait till I'm older. And if that's the case, that's, that's fine. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not religious police or anything. I will give people space and time. But you know, I, I will say the truth and it's there and I'm not gonna, God willing, you know, shy away from it. It's a heavy message, but it's, you know, it's our goal to come here, to come back and, you know, to fix ourselves and go back to God, inshallah. Um, I, my question, actually, I think um, you're probably, um, you know, a great candidate to uh, give a speech on a subject like this, because you're from the San Jose community, and um, you know, people have a lot to say specifically about this community in the sense of, you know, when people, you know, slander or you know, spread rumors and talk about, you know, how yeah. um, you know we sort of conform 
to a leader and you know there's group thinking and you know we're being brainwashed so what is your message to people um, who might have this sort of perception about our community who might be watching uh, this uh, presentation live right now okay um, I'm looking at the <laughs> no um yeah no I've, I've been I've been called things like that you know I I had a conversation with someone who said you're just a child and you know you're following whoever I don't have a mind for myself so I mean they can think what they want about me um, it's not I'm not doing it to please them I'm not doing it to please anybody I'm here genuinely trying to get back to God so it doesn't matter to me so much what they think but I will say this like you know if this message is wrong and they're ignoring it that's pretty heavy so this is like, you know what, maybe they can, they have a personal, or anybody can have a personal thing with me, but if they were just genuinely trying to take the message and take the truth, I'm reading Quranic verses, I would go to the message, not to me, who cares who I am? But this is like a fact. We're here on this planet for a reason. We're trying to get back to God. We're trying to get, you know, all God willing, go and redeem ourselves. And that's the, that's the point, you know? And people, like, you know, they can say that I'm trying to conform or I'm trying to, you know, like the Osh experiment. I'm, and, you know, we, we always want to ask ourselves, are we? Like, are we following just because this person told me to? And then we try to prove ourselves wrong. Like, when I ask myself, am I understanding this because this person told me? No, I want to, let's, let's look at it. I'll go to back to the Quran. I say, like, okay, am I, am I doing this? Like, what commandment am I breaking? What, it, what commandment is this? And then I look very objectively. I look and it truly examine myself because at the end of the day, I, I am held responsible for the, in all the information I get. I have to make the, the choice on my own because we come back to God as individuals. So that's what I would say to whoever wants to say that. Say to me. Assalamu alaikum, uh, amazing speech, mashallah. Uh, just wanted to get your thoughts on, I love how you listed the gifts from God for us to practice here on earth. Um, but one of my uh, reflections on all those gifts is, it's about getting back to the hereafter, like you said. So I just wanted to get your reflection as well in terms of the choice, like the blue pill, or the red pill. I mean, I've always looked at that as choosing this, this, this life or the next life, and then everything you do just falls into one or the other. <clears throat> yeah. But the difference is you get, you get both if you choose the hereafter. So I just wanted to get your reflection on that. Oh yeah, definitely. So um, yeah, you, you make, much like Serena said it very well too in her speech, like you make, we have one choice, right? We take either the, you know, we submit or we don't submit. You know, and if we submit, we, we understand how important these religious gifts are. Like, you know, before, you know, they came, to, uh, they were revealed through Abraham. So before that, they didn't have salat, they didn't have the zakat, they didn't have all these other things. This is like super food for our souls. Like, thank God we have it, you know? Uh, it's not, a, it's like we're, without these, these meals, we're like living on snacks, you know? And this is like uh, such a, a, a great way for us to, to grow our souls and, to, and it makes it easier. It makes it, if we continue to remember God and we do our worship practices, we're sincere, it, it becomes easier and easier to, to side with God. And God willing, like, we want to definitely uh, make the right choice. We want to have our souls so big at the day of resurrection that we're able to, to uh, withstand God's physical presence and not, you know, the other way. I, I believe it's the other way, too. If you continuously, you know, dismiss God's, you know, gifts, then you, you, it gets harder and harder until the devil claims you. <laughs> hey, Fernand. Hey, uh, salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Uh, the devil said to God, since you have willed that I go astray. So he blames God. And uh, we know that God says that he does not want robots. And what would you say to somebody who agrees with Satan and denies that they have the freedom of choice, so they deny their responsibility? What would you say to them? Well, we know also that Satan's a liar. So we know that that's not true. I mean, uh, and that's, that's like a common thing also I've seen with people who have that sort of mentality is they don't want to take ownership. They want to blame everything else but themselves, but we know that's not true. Everyone has the choice they make in this life. We can either choose to, you know, submit. And you know what, and sometimes if they don't want, they can, they, of course they can choose not to be with God. That's, that's their choice. If they don't want to be with God, God doesn't need them. So God, they, they, they don't have any of God's provisions, any of God's light, and they run on their own 
to hell. They they flee because they can't stand God's physical presence. So it's it God doesn't do anything to any nothing bad comes from God. Everything that happens bad to, is from ourselves. So when someone wants to blame others for their you know weaknesses, for their you know misunderstandings, for all these things that they have, it's just basically them being a you know lying to themselves and unable to uh, take ownership. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, they totally blame others. And I can't stand people like that. Mashallah, Fernand, very good speech. You, you can see a lot of the speeches that were given earlier, they all tie into what you were saying. Um, I, I, I want to mention something about uh, conformity. It's really important, even with you know, the um, sermon that Aaron gave, also reminded us that what the believer's way is. So conformity doesn't mean that we look at and see what are we doing amongst each other. It means that we will look and see if what we're doing amongst each other, you know, amongst ourselves, if it lines up with what God says in the Quran. Okay, because we are fallible, but God isn't. So our understanding from what God says could, just like what Ali was saying earlier today, you know, we may have the wrong understanding sometimes, but we cannot because we are um, best. Our best friend thinks like that, and our you know amongst ourselves, like you know, just because or my husband thinks that way, or my children, then I'm going to agree with them. Versus, I, I still have to gauge what everybody says against the Quran, and that's what will make us not robots, also because. The devil is going to try to use every which way that it can to send us astray, right? Yeah. And one of its ways is the right, you know, coming from the right. And it's going to say that, well, you know, all the believers are doing it this way, so why aren't you doing it this way? I still am responsible. I still, as an individual, am responsible to look at the believer's actions and see if it lines up with the Quran, you know, and make my decision based on that. The same way that we are telling our children, you know, I mean, every, we, we have an example from the Quran that God says, <clears throat> excuse me, do not follow your parents blindly. And we see these younger children, you know, like Payam was saying, age five, he started fasting and doing his contact prayers. And a lot of our children have been the same way. And someone will look at it and say, well, you're, follow, you're just following your parents. Well, yeah, at that age, they could be doing. But for him, he was saying, like, when he was in fourth grade, it suddenly became like, uh oh, I need to, I need to, you know, deal with this myself. I need to stand up against these people myself, and I have to understand why. And that's that's the point that we stop doing what we are. Um, we, we stop following just because, and we start following because it is the right thing to do, because we have come to the right conclusion. So it's important. And at the end of that um, movie, we will see that that he gets to a point where he is so sure of who he is, yeah. okay, that he becomes certain. Yeah, certain that no matter what bullets come towards him, it, it's it, the devils, the agents were not stopping. You know, they, they're, you know, our most ardent enemy is Satan. So he will ceaselessly try to ruin us, right? Yeah. But he became so certain that he just, when the bullets were coming, he would just look at them, tilt his head, and they would fall, right? It was no longer an issue for him. Yeah. And that's how, mashallah, at the end, we'll see, for us, that's how it should be. We would, we would come to that conclusion, we'll come to a state where we will look at falsehood, and it's not going to bother us, it's just going to roll off our backs. Mashallah. Actually, you said a few things I wanted to actually say on your speech, too. So this is the thing, like, okay, so I know I mentioned the conformity video, but see, here's the thing. If we're following the truth, that means we're all going to conform to it. It doesn't mean it's wrong. Like, if I say two plus two is four, and everybody says four, that doesn't mean we're all sheep. That means it's four, you know? And so, and I'm sorry, but people who think, like, oh, because you think it's four, you're arrogant or whatever, it's, I'm just doesn't make any sense. So we definitely, and as you said, we, that doesn't mean we shouldn't have our responsibility of examining the information and making sure we're not doing it. But if it's the truth, we should not be afraid of it. We shouldn't be afraid to say, yes, this is right. Because God says it. If God says it in the Quran, I can 100% say it's the truth. 